Hi everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. I am Eve Engler. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I'm coming you Hi to everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. I am Eve Engler. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. So I'm coming to you live from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. Uh, and uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a weekly uh, critical look at Canada's role abroad. And we are uh, around the uh, 80th uh, session uh, of this um, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I need to be off uh, for seven o'clock. So I'll get right to some of the uh, some of the headlines. Uh, today is Globe and Mail has a piece titled Thousands Still Die Annually from, a, from Asbestos Exposure, WHO Says. And it's a story about um, India and how many still die in India from asbestos, cancers related to asbestos. And it goes into a little bit of uh, Canada's role in uh, selling asbestos, but also in promoting asbestos and how uh, the legacy of, of those Canadian policies are still leading to, uh, to thousands of deaths uh, in, uh, in India, even though the Canadian government uh, kind of backed away from that maybe, uh, I think about a decade ago now almost, but for years, decades, was a, was a leading force in, uh, in promoting uh, asbestos uh, uh, internationally. I just saw a post about uh, from Panama and that after uh, a week of massive protests that basically shuttered big parts of the country, the president today announced a uh, referendum on First Quantum's copper mine, this huge copper mine deal that's been very controversial in, uh, in Panama. And so they're going to have a referendum on this, I guess, uh, in, uh, in mid-December. And the Canadian government has been uh, has been promoting First Quantum's uh, interests in the country. Uh, Puglesi at the Ottawa Citizen had a story about the uh, uh, Canada's eight billion dollar uh, uh, surveillance aircraft purchase, about the um, the problems with parts and reliability. Uh, so this is another eight billion dollars in uh, in public resources uh, going to. Um, expanding Canada's military uh, uh, capacities, but apparently there's uh, problems with the aircraft. The Financial Times reports that the EU is backing what, what has been really a Canadian uh, promoted initiative that the US has gotten behind of uh, seizing Russia's frozen assets, most specifically about $300 billion in um, in bank, uh, bank of Russia uh, uh, assets, which I believe are principally in the EU. And it looks like EU is gonna go forward. This is something that Christian Freeland has been, a, has been a big pusher of um, right from the get-go. And that would go uh, quite a ways in, uh, if they actually take the assets and the plan is to give them to, uh, to Ukraine, that would go quite a ways in, um, in, in, in rupturing um, the relationship with, with Russia uh, in the medium, uh, maybe not long, long term, but certainly in, in, the, in the medium term. So that would be a big step of, of along in this, this, uh, this really sort of aggressive uh, uh, policy. Now, uh, five months into the uh, counteroffensive, clearly it, it has failed. It looks like Russia is on the, uh, in, on the, uh, uh, on the charge, uh, and Russia is probably taking more territory right now than than Ukraine is. Uh, so it's an incredible amount of human uh, loss uh, for very little uh, change on the battlefield. And I just saw a story about a profile of Zelensky, and apparently, according to this Times, or I, I read the summary on on Twitter uh, from Aaron Mate's Twitter, and. Uh, Zelensky still believes uh, they're going to win, um, and basically it's a bunch of people around him, his advisors quoted anonymously in the uh, profile, 
saying that he's he's sort of uh, messianic. He's basically deluded uh, about what's actually happening. Um, so uh, uh, it's uh, it's been an incredible uh, toll. Obviously, Washington, Ottawa, London have helped in uh, in deluding uh, Zelensky and pushing him into this uh, into this position. Uh, the University of Ottawa professor uh, Ivan Kachinovsky uh, reported that um, says uh, un unreported uh, million word maiden massacre trial verdict corroborates my academic studies by stating as as its quote categorical conclusion that there were snipers shooting from maiden controlled hotel Ukraine and that it cannot be ruled out that eight protesters were killed and 20 wounded by unknown persons who were, quote, not law enforcement officers. Um, so this is a uh, further confirmation of what uh, he's been saying, that the, the mass death at the end of the uh, maiden uh, protests in, uh, in Ukraine that ousted Yanukovych, that the in fact there were snipers in the uh, hotels that were controlled by the uh, protesters, which undermine undermines the idea that the Yanukovych government was uh, was responsible for the for the killings, which is what ultimately justified the process of of ousting him, and that led to this the seizing of Crimea, the war in the east, and played an important role in in the in the violence uh, uh, today. The uh, Journal de Montréal published a series of pieces this week. Um, one was titled on, on uh, purported uh, Chinese uh, propaganda. One was titled uh, Un centre de propagande chinoise en plein centre-ville. So a, a Chinese propaganda center in, uh, in the middle of downtown. Uh, and another one was uh, Propagande pro-Chine depuis Montréal, uh, Chinese propaganda from Montreal. And, and they just, they don't give you much. Um, one of the things they talk about, one of these um, community organizations they talk about has been around for like 50 years. And they say it's basically a, a Chinese propaganda front. And, and there are examples of why it's a Chinese propaganda and list like things that this organization has stated. And one of them is, is that, and none of them from, I like none of them seem to, None of the points seemed controversial that the group was making to me. It seemed all like totally reasonable and generally correct uh, 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 positions from this organization. But one of them that they cited, and it was actually probably the biggest one they cite, is that uh, uh, I'm translating here. China has been a success um, uh, um, that's undermined U.S. hegemony, which has been established uh for 200 years occidental um you know western hegemony that's been uh, um, established for 200 years uh, it is therefore inevitable that the us will will use all its means uh to undermine uh chinese development in a bid to uh undermine its role in uh reforming uh uh reforming china and and the world relations so basically saying that that China's power is a threat to U.S. Western hegemony and it's going to elicit a reaction. It, it, this is being cited as like this sort of like dangerous, nefarious uh, uh, Chinese community center, which is like a, a, probably a position that like, I don't know, seven billion or five five billion people in the world hold that it's like that the u.s considers china a threat because it's challenges its power i mean it, it's nothing at, at all controversial about the point but for the journal de montreal they frame this as an example of that the the, uh, the dangerous chinese propaganda in downtown montreal um there was also a whole bunch of stories this week about the um, the spamouflage, Chinese spamouflage that I mentioned that I saw a press release just before the start of last week's session from Global Affairs. And it's really, again, it's a really quite vague of what the spamouflage is. Basically, they're saying that Chinese related um, uh, organizations targeted Canadian politicians with these deep fake 
the sort of attack uh, social media posts uh, as a way to sort of, you know, go after them. Now, one of the stories, the National Post story, has this kind of odd uh, uh, bit in it where it says that, quote, most of the messages received very little direct engagement, such as likes, shares, or replies. But that wasn't the point. So apparently there was this Chinese government spamouflage targeting the prime minister and Canadian politicians that didn't get any traction. But don't, don't worry, that's not that doesn't matter because the real point was to intimidate the politicians. So they were targeting them on social media with these different attack things that didn't have any basically any effect or very little effect on social media. But don't worry, that wasn't really the point. There was another point of doing this, which was to intimidate them. That's what the National Post wants us to believe. And I, and I you know, I don't, I don't, I don't doubt that there's Chinese intelligence, Chinese government, whatever uh, entities that would engage in one way or another in social media sort of attacks against Canadian politicians. I, that's that's certainly a, a, a plausible, uh, imaginable thing, but it's not very uh, credible when they basically, th those making the claim say they're just like not effective. Um, uh, but there's some other uh, point to it all. Um, in the release, uh, in the global affairs release, they point out the the global affairs is rapid response mechanism, which is this body that's supposed to be ready to reply to these attacks from foreign interference, really China. And uh, they they admit that their source for this spamouflage stuff is is actually the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which has been. Uh, detailed is well known for its important role in in sort of uh, U.S. Australian military uh, circles in term, terms of turning Australia uh, into more conflictual relationship with um, with uh, with uh, with China. Um, in a more uh, significant uh, repeating, uh, but but nonetheless uh, stating it again. Um, the head of the Cape military uh, in Ottawa citizen story, Puglesi gets uh, a document from the Cape military about the threats. And he's, and the Wayne Ear is quoted as saying that China and Russia see themselves at war with Canada. And it's all kind of bizarre. Uh, they say they're either war with, uh, with the West. Okay. Which includes obviously Canada. And um, in this document, there's, they, there's barely acknowledgement of climate change as a threat, um, which seems pretty contrary to uh, reality. Uh, China and Russia are these big threats. And there's a, um, they, see, they seem to suggest that they don't distinguish between, China and Russia don't distinguish between times of peace and war, kind of a weird uh, uh, claim. Now, all this, to my mind, is projection. Right. This is, in fact, that the Canadian military sees itself at war with Russia and China. And this is about laying the the um, the uh, I think I forgot to uh, spotlight myself here. Um, this is uh, this is the laying the groundwork for justifying Canadian growing Canadian. Uh, uh, well, military spending, but also, uh, you know, deployment of of naval vessels, by planes, etc., uh, to the region, uh, regions, I guess, because both uh, both uh, obviously major Canadian deployments in in Eastern Europe, uh, and also increasing deployments in um, in uh, Japan and uh, and near uh, near China. Uh, and so this is obviously tied into Biden's plan of getting a uh, hundred billion dollars uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, to uh, to fund weapons. Ukraine, I think it's sixty billion for Ukraine, uh, billions for Taiwan. I think it's now I think it's fourteen billion for for Israel. This plan that and then there's also some I think money going to so-called border security and. Uh, 
this is Canada sort of, you know, joining in this, this, uh, this, um, um, craziness. I mean, really, quite frankly, uh, you know, walking ourselves to a position where not only is this NATO proxy war in Ukraine, uh, possibly escalating to um, something uh, similar in in uh, in the Middle East. Obviously, we're seeing horrors. We'll get to that later on in Gaza, but also increasing uh, 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 fighting on the border between uh, Lebanon and Israel, and then also uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, Taiwan. Now, I wanted to mention just briefly, at least, um, uh, Maude Barlow. I think I've talked about how Maude Barlow, who's a former count, head of the Council of Canadians, for a long time, one of the most prominent left-wing activists in Canada. I, a couple of days ago, I went on, uh, Maude Barlow is just a total fanatic proponent of the NATO proxy war, just totally over the top, tweets about it regularly, uh, um, and I ended up, I don't know how I ended up on her Twitter, but I what, ended up on Twitter. I decided I was going to take a look and sort of see what she's been saying about uh, what's happening in Israel, Gaza. And what I basically found is nothing, just silence. And I thought that was really kind of like encapsulates it. Because the idea here, of course, with the NATO proxy war is that, you know, Russia did something so egregious and, you know, I'm aligning with with Ottawa in responding to this incredibly egregious Russian uh, move. And, uh, you know, so that's why you sort of end up in bed with NATO. But in fact, you find out, which is not not, of course, surprising that the people who tend to go that position also tend to align with the Canadian media's perspective on Palestine um, elsewhere, you know, Haiti, many <laughs> Pretty much everywhere, but but very obviously right now with uh, with with uh, Palestine, and she just said she's just no no comment. You know, Israel's destruction of Gaza is, doesn't seem to have elicited any any reaction from uh, from Maud Barlow, which is which is uh, I, I think quite um, uh, remarkable uh, uh, comment on how how uh, geopolitically aligned much of the left is, right. If you're not if you're not able to condemn the uh, the uh, atrocities in Gaza, you you while uh, pushing the you know pumping weapons into uh, into Ukraine, um, you have uh, clearly uh, I think lost your moral compass. But also you've basically just um, you just follow the media, which you know at one level maybe uh, makes sense. Now, uh, the 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 main issue I want to talk about today, of course, is the uh, the horrors in Gaza and the battles, the incredible political battles that this is this is turning into here. Um, there's lots of upside. I'll get to the upside at the end of this, uh, but uh, uh, start off with maybe the more the negative side. The the uh, and I'm not I'm not going to go in the real negative side, which is just just how horrendous what we're what we're seeing is and and uh, um, people I'm sure have have are aware it's over 8,000 uh, Palestinians killed uh, I think now it's probably into the 5,000 range of children because of this apparently 2,000 children um, under rubble that um, that um, will probably be determined as dead um, but um, we we heard that the Canadian special forces uh, over the weekend, Global News said the Canadian Special Forces are in Israel. Now, a, a number of people online framed that as, you know, Canada's joining in. And I, count me a little bit skeptical. Not like, I think it's worth kind of unpackaging what we expect. Now, the Canadian, the, the official story is that they're there just there to help for security. Uh, evacuations and stuff like that, and and that I believe is true. I believe the JTF two is there. That's and JTF two, of course, is the is the cream of the crop. This is the top of the special forces, and um, I think that they are there for security uh, purposes, evacuation and stuff like that. Now, um, I think it is plausible. Of course, the Americans and stories about American uh, preparing troops. They, of course, and aircraft carrier, another naval vessel that they've sent to support Israel. 
so I think it's plausible to think that the JTF2 may, and the JTF2 is supposed to be, you know, involved in like hostage uh, um, uh, negotiations or, you know, recovery. And they were dispatched to Iraq in 2006, I believe, uh, when there was Canadian uh, kidnapped uh, there. And, uh, and then some other, there's, we, we think in other cases as well. Uh, they operate a, a large degree of secrecy, so it's hard to know. Um, now, but but I think that I, I'm I doubt that they're, they're going to be entering Gaza and going going to find the Canadians that are kidnapped or, or you know taken detained by uh, by uh, Hamas. Uh, I'm doubtful of that. Um, uh, I think it's plausible they're involved in some uh, uh, sort of operational planning, thinking, whatever. Uh, um, but I, but I think that they, what we do, what we can be cl clear about is that you know Israel probably doesn't let uh, special forces from Chile or Russia, or certainly not um, Iran or or uh, or uh, uh, Syria enter the country, right? So the fact that they're letting Canadian special forces in speaks to a certain type of relationship that Canada has militarily with with Israel. And, and one of the things that didn't get much play, I saw actually pro-Israel people uh, tweeting about this. And then I saw, and I wasn't sure if it was true. And then I saw it confirmed in an article. But Canada, the Canadian military uh, brought brought uh, uh, 30 uh, Israeli reservists uh, back into the country um, in the recent days, right? So they were flying out Canadians, evacuating Canadians, and they had empty planes coming, uh, coming from Athens and a uh, they flew about 30, apparently, uh, uh, Israeli reservists into the country. So that's just a, you know, a small example of that relationship, the Canadian military. Uh, they obviously have Operation Proteus, which is the, about 20 Canadian forces uh, building up the Palestinian security force that, that works you know, hand in hand with the Israeli, uh, uh, both intelligence and military establishment. Uh, lots of visits between Canadian generals, top Canadian officials, and their and is Israeli military. You got that border border security deal. Even though last I looked, there is no border uh, between Canada and Israel. Um, so so there is a you know extensive uh, military to military ties, and I think that's obviously important in 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 why Israel would allow Canadian special forces in the country. And uh, now, what those special forces end up doing, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. I also, at the intelligence level, the Five Eyes, um, tons of intelligence, uh, the Canadian military communication, communication security establishment, and Canadian military intelligence, uh, intelligence sharing with the with their Israeli uh, 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 counterparts. One way in that which that seems to have kind of manifested itself was that Canada basically echoing the U.S. Uh, Israeli claim that the Anglican hospital in Gaza, where officially 471 people were killed, that that was the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that was responsible. And that was the Canadian military's conclusion that uh, Bill Blair released about a week ago, I guess. And uh, La Presse quoted uh, uh, an Israeli official saying they were delighted that Canada has drawn the same conclusion as the United States and France on the errant rocket in Gaza. Now, the New York Times had a front page article on four, three, four days ago that basically poured cold water on us. This, this is bullshit. This is this, this the, the claim that Israel and how the Israel and the US are framing this as um, the, the evidence they brought forward doesn't hold whatsoever, according to the New York Times piece. I still strongly believe that it was, was exactly what uh, was initially reported, and uh, all evidence subsequently, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, confirms that, which is that Israel is uh, is bombing lots of hospitals, threatening lots of hospitals, uh, uh, blowing up uh, lots of people, and are not too uh, um, uh, too uh, uh, concerned about uh, the uh, the human toll. Um, Bill Blair, the new defense minister, on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. He said that that we're going to defeat Hamas. The aim is to defeat Hamas. He said, quote, I think they have a right to defend themselves against that terrorist threat. And quite frankly, Hamas has to be eliminated as a threat, not just to Israel, but to the world. 
Well, eliminating Hamas means tens of thousands, probably more, but ten, certainly tens of thousands of dead. Uh, we're already probably getting ourselves towards 10,000 dead. And, um, and uh, that would mean tens, tens of thousands, uh, at least, you know, huge numbers more. Uh, if that would be, that's even possible. Uh, also, the business about having a right to defend itself is, uh, I mean, this can be just repeated endlessly, uh, but, you know, what that means uh, in practice. Now, simultaneously, Trudeau is opposing calls for uh, ceasefire. Uh, the Canadian uh, Bloc Québécois MP in a foreign affairs committee asked if the, what the Canadian government's opinion, the, legal, the legality of the uh, heightened blockade, water, electricity, food, et cetera, in Gaza. And the response was Canada has no opinion, uh, has no opinion on the, the, the legality of that. Uh, today, in her big speech, uh, 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 foreign policy, Jolie, uh, one of the things she, she posted to Twitter uh, based on it, she said that, um, um, she said, understanding that threats to international, uh, Oh, I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, I, I messed up the quote. I don't have the proper quote, but basically that, that um, uh, this, this uh, defense of, uh, of uh, international law, uh, that international law is central to Canadian foreign policy uh, in the context um, of just the incredible uh, uh, destruction in Gaza and uh, Israel's violation of, of, of international law. Uh, Michael Bucker from uh, Can Answer Justice of the Peace in the Middle East, he pointed out on Twitter that, quote, since 2021, Canada's parliament has accused both Russia and China of committing genocide. But when, but when faced with Israel bombing thousands of civilians in Gaza, cutting off 2 million people from water and food and ordering 1 million to evacu evacuate, Canada won't even call for the bombs to stop. Um, when there's you know hundreds of scholars, genocide study scholars saying this is genocide, all kinds of declarations from Israeli officials, including Netanyahu, making a reference to, to uh, the Bible about basically the annihilation. Uh, just did this on Friday, uh, justifying what to be done against Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, the 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 idea that this is you know there's no one. I mean. Jagmeet Singh referenced the seeds of genocide, but the fact that the Canadian Parliament, um, the genocidal nature of what's going on in Gaza is infinitely, infinitely more uh, uh, clear than um, what Russia is doing in Ukraine. However brutal, uh, the idea that that's genocidal is just nonsense. And, 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 and the Uyghur question is also... Uh, um, uh, what what Israel's doing in Gaza is 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 in so many different ways uh, uh, more flagrant um, uh, uh, genocidal uh, intent and and uh, and actions than anything um, uh, China's accused of. On Friday, uh, Canada uh, abstained on a UN resolution for protection of civilians and uphold upholding legal and humanitarian obligations. Uh, 120 countries uh, voted for that UN General Assembly resolution. Canada pushed a amendment to uh, solely condemn Hamas, and that was uh, that amendment failed. And that was Bob Ray that that pushed that. And people may have seen the uh, the response by Pakistan's uh, minister or uh, UN ambassador, where he basically says, "You just want to you cite Hamas." Uh, but we believe we believe if you're going to cite Hamas, you have to cite Israel. And he goes into how many have been killed, how many have been injured, and just how one-sided Canada's position is. And that that the, the video of that's been viewed like three million times on on Twitter. So we've got a lot of circulation of the of the Pakistani ambassador uh, criticizing uh, Bob Ray um, uh, in very diplomatic language, but quite 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 forcefully. And it made me think of. Um, of a uh, the Pakistani ambassador at the UN um, historic very important uh, comment uh, on this question, and so 
during the, the, the discussion around the partition plan in 1947 at the UN, the, the Canadian government tried to frame their support for partition as about, uh, you know, kind of humanitarian and, and um, giving a, a place for the uh, uh, post-World War II uh, Jewish refugees who were, you know, hundreds of thousands were displaced, uh, obviously from the horrors of the Nazis. And but but the Canadian government simultaneously uh, opposed uh, um, a resolution, uh, a proposal uh, to have member states take in Jewish refugees. So on one hand, we oppose the idea of member states taking in Jewish refugees, but then we claim that we're supporting partition and, and Zionist uh, uh, policies because of the you know bad situation of European uh, Jewish refugees. And so, and so the, the Pakistani ambassador said, those who talk of humanitarian principles and can afford to do the most have done the least at their own expense to alleviate, alleviate the Jewish refugee crisis. But they are ready, indeed are, they are anxious to be most generous at the expense of the Arab. Australia, Canada, and the United States were opposed to returning the Jewish displaced persons to their countries of origin. But were they ready to absorb them themselves? Australia, an overpopulated small country with congested areas, says no, 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 no. Canada, equally congested and overpopulated, says no. The United States, a great humanitarian country, a small country with small resources, says no. This was their contribution to the humanitarian principle. While stating at the same time, let them go to Palestine, where there are vast areas, a large economy, and no trouble. They can easily be taken in there. Right. So this the they obviously understood this back in 47, incredible hypocrisy. And the, the Pakistani ambassador, uh, the U.N., um, uh, pushing back against Canada's uh, uh, moral uh, uh, framing of its pushing of Zionism uh, and the partition plan in, in, in 40, uh, 47. Uh, so on Friday, Trudeau met with the head of federation, uh, CJA, the main uh, uh, Jewish organization here in Montreal, also with the one of the representatives of CJA and a number of other uh, uh, Jewish uh, organizations, obviously pro-Zionist uh, Jewish organizations. And he, he also met with, um, with uh, Jewish students at and it was framed as you know these students from Concordia and McGill and Dawson who are University of Montreal who are you know being besieged and and we want to hear their concerns and obviously what they're referring to is pro palestinian demonstrations and whatnot and one of the images that Trudeau is 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 uh, tweeted out has him sitting in a room a community center maybe a school uh, and this Israeli flag uh, uh, in the back and uh, on the weekend on Sunday. I went to the uh, the genocide rally, the pro genocide rally here in Montreal that the uh, Federation CJA, CJA, and others uh, organized. They they framed it as a as a release the hostages uh, uh, rally. Uh, obviously, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, Israeli flags. They were giving them out free. I got myself one uh, for future purposes. Um, and uh, 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 Anthony Housefather, the MP, Liberal MP was there, Kotler was there, the Israeli consul was there. And they 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 framed it as this, uh, it's it's uh, one of the things they said a bunch was, you know, Hamas is ISIS. Uh, it's it's 2023, not 1943. So, so uh, uh, you know, Jews won't be pushed around. Uh, they said there was conflict between the forces of, quote, light and darkness. Those were some of the main, the main themes I heard. Uh, uh, being stated um, at this uh, this rally, and uh, this whole push of the hostages question, I find totally this is clearly the central kind of like propaganda uh, framing of the genocide uh, lobby. Now uh, they had uh, uh, billboards in, on the in Toronto uh, taken out with the names of the uh, Israelis that have been detained by Hamas. Um, and this was really the push at the rally on Sunday. Um, you know, within all of that, of course, the the fact that there's way more Palestinians that have been kidnapped by Israel over the past three weeks, uh, something like five times, six times, seven, 
I guess it's over 1500. So, so 230. So yeah, six, seven times, uh, how many, uh, uh, Israelis were kidnapped. Uh, but they, they're able to really make push that because no one talks about the Palestinians that have been, that have been, um, uh, uh, kidnapped by Israel, let alone the, the thousands and thousands of Palestinians that are, you know, detained in Israeli jails, often with no, you know, no, uh, no court case even. Um, so, so that's clearly a big part of the, uh, uh, uh propaganda element. Um, I do want to finish, uh, right at seven. So I'm going to maybe skip a few things and get to a couple other questions. So, um, the repressive element, we still see that, uh, uh, continuing that people standing up for Palestinians, Zara Akras, uh, who says she's the only Palestinian journalist at global. She was fired for her social media posts. And Yara Jamal, uh, who was uh, working with CTV, she was also uh, uh, turfed. The Journal de Montréal had a story about how the students uh, at McGill and uh, Concordia were both uh, targeted by the administration. There was uh, uh, big demonstrations on um, Wednesday, I think it was. There was a walkout, maybe it was Tuesday, I don't remember, Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, I went by the McGill one. There was hundreds, 500 plus uh, at McGill. Um, uh, and uh, I saw images from Concordia and there was uh, big, huge hundreds and hundreds that they took over the, the mezzanine at the hall building, the main area at Concordia. And the administration is, 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 uh, is pushing back against that. The World Socialist website had a story titled, Enforcing Ontario government's witch hunt, York University threatens pro-Palestinian student association with deregistration. So I think we talked about that last week, but that's continuing on uh, those intimidation tactics. We're seeing some uh, pushback. Uh, the Globe had a piece about the University of Toronto Mississauga uh, uh, student union uh, saying it won't be bullied and condemning the Ontario uh, uh, minister uh, who for defaming them. So we're seeing pretty good uh, pushback, I think, for the most part, not really cowing. And um, we're seeing a pushback kind of more, more broadly. So uh, the Maple today had a story titled, uh, the uh, Canadian Labour is lining up in support of Palestinians. This, uh, this weekend, uh, well, actually, we start off with Friday. On Friday, um, we had the, the uh, uh, Trudeau, was uh, was here in uh, Montreal, which we found out about um, uh, late, and uh, we uh, we had a little um, rally. We had a very boisterous rally. I'll just show you a little clip uh, of Trudeau uh, walking out. So, so uh, Trudeau was speaking, and we got probably about fifty. We had fifty people at eight a.m. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a logistical uh, uh, information sharing uh, mess up, so we probably actually could have had a, more success in actually blocking, or just not blocking, but but um, disrupting his entrance into the into the uh, building. Uh, but a few of us got inside uh, in the building. Um, uh, Scott Weinstein and I got kicked out. And uh, we got right next to the door and we're yelling loud and everyone inside uh, uh, heard it. And they, they we had people like blocking the um, the parking garage. Uh, and then the Trudeau's RCMP detail did a whole like a fairly elaborate feint where they had an, an extra car and right next to a side door, like they were going to whip take them out the back way. So that forced us to send uh a dozen or so people at the back of the building to to uh, to to watch that, and then we had people in the front and then around. Anyways, he he then went out the the front, and um, you saw a bit of the image there where he certainly heard us, and uh, and that clip actually crazily is eight point seven million views in on one Twitter uh, um, uh, feed, and then hundreds of thousands more on others, and then I posted it to some other social media. And uh, it's got hundreds of thousands more there. So people clearly um, are angry. And uh, over the weekend, 
we had the biggest demonstrations uh, here in Montreal, almost for sure the biggest demonstration in Canadian uh, pro-Palestinian history, 20,000 in Montreal. Uh, I saw images from Toronto, huge in Toronto, maybe the biggest, I don't know for sure about Toronto, maybe the biggest in Toronto history. I heard there was 5,000 in Vancouver, so I image very big, probably the biggest in Vancouver. Uh, I saw stuff from Sudbury, St. John's, uh, Winnipeg, Ottawa. Also, people said, uh, I think, either the biggest or among the biggest ever in Ottawa. Um, and then today, or I think probably still going on, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, 17 different uh, MPs' offices that have been occupied uh, across the country. And uh, and also there was a big uh, direct action at uh, the Toronto manufacturing of uh, Incas, the uh, which builds uh, light armored vehicles uh, for their they sell to to Israel. And I think there was five people arrested in that uh, in that blockade that began this morning. Um, there was a poll that on done on a survey on October twenty one and twenty two asked Canadians. Uh, uh, Canada should support Israel, should can whether Canada should support Israel in its armed conflict against Hamas. And 30% said strongly disagree, 19% strongly agreed. Um, and that's, of course, a formulation that I would I reject. That's you know, that's a pro-Zionist uh, formulation. And uh, and still the the population is against. And and obviously, if they if the media wasn't so uh, so one-sided, that would that would change even more. Um, the one upside of being at the pro-genocide uh, rally organized by the, the Israel lobby in Montreal is that it was very skewed, unlike the massive, uh, there, were, there were thousands, I have to say, there were thousands. The, the pro-Israel groups are claiming 10,000. I don't think it was that big, but there was, I said, over 2,000, and it was certainly multiple thousands. Um, is that that was very skewed age-wise. It was basically old people. Um, whereas the the pro Palestinian demonstration Saturday here in Montreal was um, was pretty reflective of demo broad broad demographics, if anything, skewed more uh, young, um, and uh, and uh, uh, so so this is a you know this is a serious battle. Obviously, the liberals have to be concerned, even though the media goes out of its way. You know, they they really publicize the the Israel rally on Sunday, and they barely covered the, the pro-Palestinian rally on Saturday. Um, and they'll probably mostly ignore the office occupations today, but it's clearly getting pretty wide circulation on social, social media. And the liberals have to be concerned at this point uh, with uh, particularly the a bunch of writings they have that are of large Arab and, and Muslim uh, uh, populations. And um, and obviously we need to just expand uh, the resistance. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. And uh, I, I do want to be off uh, right at seven if it's possible. And I will make uh, Laura a, a uh, co-host. And if people have uh, questions, comments, uh, go ahead. Oh, so I, I think maybe I didn't I didn't unmute you, Laura. Oh, okay. So unfortunately, somehow I did something that got rid of Sandu. Sandu, no, nope, I'm you? here. Okay, great. Go ahead, Sandu. Yeah, hi, Eva. Uh, um, I imagine, or I'm not sure. Did you actually catch Melanie Julie's uh, address to the Economic Club? I didn't. I read. I read. Okay, the you, you. I, I did. It was a live on CPAC. You have to have to go back and check it out. Uh, this is her long-awaited uh, vision for foreign policy. You know, she's been talking about it for, well, uh, quite a while. And just very quickly, uh, there's two pillars to it. Uh, one is that she's going to use uh, using pragmatic diplomacy to prevent international conflicts. Okay, mm -hmm. that's one pillar. Sounds very nice. And she actually went all out in terms of resisting the temptation to divide the world into ideological camps. The global South can't afford to choose, you know, this over that. Um, tremendous sort of sense that she understands the geopolitics, uh, rebalancing that's happening and all the rest of it, right? And then the second pillar was 
defending our sovereignty. And of course, it's all about NORAD, NATO, uh, F-35s, you name it. It's a sort of war and, and pestilence everywhere. And I've been kind of, uh, I mean, maybe next week, I'd be interested to see your take on it. But the timing of it uh, is very critical, it seems to me, right? Um, because the APAC meeting is coming up on November 11th. And that's supposed to be the big rapprochement between uh, uh, Biden and uh, Xi Jinping. And the Chinese have already said that it's not going to go smooth. So maybe they're just it's a tactic. I don't know. But it was really odd to listen to her talk, given the government's track record. And even now, um, uh, so I'd really be curious to see what's your take on it. Like, what's the sort of motivation and that? Because on the one hand, it's really schizophrenic. It's like you're sitting there saying, my God, they get it. And then you just say, um, actually, it doesn't look like they get it at all. Uh, they're kind of hoodwinking you. Um, but if, if you don't mind, perhaps next week you could uh, spare some time to just share your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I, re I read that it was on the front page of the Globe and I read that piece today. And there was also a global, um, I think a glo it was global news, a, a piece I read online and, about it. And uh, yeah, I'm always like, I'm always, I find these speeches kind of like, you know, they're worth taking a look at, but, but they, they, they don't, to me, they sort of, it, it's, you know, it's looking at what actually happens rather than what they, what they say. Right. And they all come up with these, these different, you know, framings that, that, uh, um, and then, you know, what that means in practice. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I probably try to, Whoa. Is that me? Okay. Sorry, that, <laughs> that somehow hit something. But yeah, I, I'm always like, uh, um, yeah, I just I find that they they come up with the you know framings and then and then what what in practice and that's why I was pulling out the 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 quote from about. Uh, about about uh, inter I, which I screwed up with with regards to international law that Jolie was put on her Twitter is that you just sort of say you know they they can say these things while they while there's just this such crass violation of international law such crass war crimes that they are you know applauding it's always you know quite quite uh, uh, impressive but but um, in terms of uh, the APAC. And the China thing, I, I, you know, I still am the, of the opinion, and uh, some people seem to not agree with me on this in, in more sort of left-wing circles. I think the liberals are being, they're reluctant on China. As, as much as they've gotten, you know, hawkish on China, they have been kind of pulled along uh, to more hawkish positions. And, uh, and uh, uh, um, you know, I think there's division within the liberal party. So uh, uh, they don't. I don't think they. I don't think they do want to just have these sort of clear cut camps of uh, geopolitical camps where where you know you 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 delink from uh, uh, completely delink from China, which some sectors of the American empire clearly want. Um, clearly want. Okay, Jake, you're up. Yes, uh, this is just a comment, and it's about the unconscionable and so disturbing to me and most likely to many, many others to witness how those Western heads of uh, Western countries, including, of course, Canada and others, those criminal heads fell upon themselves to, to push Israel to do genocide in Gaza by saying that Israel has the right to defend themselves. What right Israel has to defend themselves? From what? From their crimes of 100 years, first the Zionists and then Israelis? For 100 years, they're doing nothing but utmost crimes. So they have the right to defend themselves? The only one and the only ones that have the right to defend themselves are the Palestinians. It's the same like saying that, uh, this is not for comparison, but the Nazis had the right to defend themselves. Or a serial killer, we have to give him more guns because he has to 
defend himself. It's unbelievable how skewed it is. And, and it goes beyond just the rhetoric. I mean, I just, you know, I mentioned you have Canadian Special Forces there. You have Canada's military uh, sending, uh, you know, giving free plane rides back for Israeli reservists. You have uh, the, J Melanie Jolie flying to Israel to to basically say, we got your back. Uh, obviously, the U.S. is doing even even more. I mean, the U.S. is talking about sending $14 billion in, in special... Uh, you know, genocide, a special genocide contribution to Israel, right? You have you have these the United Jewish Appeal of, of Toronto doing their big fundraising pitch. They probably raised a hundred million dollars in tax deductible donations to send to Israel. I mean, this is uh this is uh you know it's not it's not just rhetorical uh, support it's it is actually concrete um uh support for 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 these policies. So it it definitely it it makes a mockery uh, of you know any claims to being against war crimes, being against you know standing for international law, uh, etc. Okay, Greg, you're up. Oh, thank you, uh, Laura. Yeah, yes, I don't. I've I've been getting some reports that on October seventh, when the Hamas attack occurred, the Israeli response uh, they responded just because they couldn't determine Hamas from party goers and so forth. Uh, they actually started just shooting indiscriminately, hellfire missiles and everything in their arsenal from uh, attack helicopters. Uh, and I've seen some footage and cars are literally melted with charred corpses in them. And Hamas, from what I understand, didn't have those types of weapons in carrying out this. So, I'm, and there are eyewitness accounts apparently of Israelis saying that is, the IDF was sh just sh shooting to kill everybody. And part of it is a strategy to avoid uh, Israeli hostages being taken as well. So I don't know if you uh, if you can give any credence to those reports. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I've read a number of stories, the Cradle story, Mondoy story, uh, and others that, that detail that. I, that makes total sense to me. I, 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 I think it's clear. Uh, oh, um, Gray Zone had a long story uh, uh, with some of this stuff. Uh, it 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 makes total sense to me that. So I don't think anyone is denying that Hamas killed civilians, and that not just killed civilians, but purposely killed civilians. Not just you know shooting at 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 um, you know Israeli soldiers or police and happened to kill a civilian, but that there was purposeful. Hamas killing of civilians. Oh, I really that's, that's that's actually videoed on on apparently on the Telegram and stuff that Hamas uh, had it. had. Um, uh, but what what also seems to have happened, and this makes sense to me, that the first question is is what you know from a Hamas perspective, individuals civilians are generally more valuable kidnapped than they were dead. Uh, there is part of a strategy to get the 5,000 plus Palestinians in, in Israeli jails, uh, get them out. And that's a big deal for Palestinians and right, rightfully so. Uh, and so you kidnap to have something to exchange. Um, and there's, there's, this has happened, you know, many, many times over the years. And Israel has a whole like directive, I think it's called the cannibal directive that, that, uh, tries to avoid that. And, and, you know, the, part of what that is, is kill everyone to avoid having hostages. And so it seems to me from the reports that some of the stuff that happened at the kibbutzes, that's that the Israelis came in and, and uh, uh, you know, purposely sort of killed everyone. Uh, so that that's um, seems, you know, I'm not I wouldn't say that with like 100 percent confidence or anything like that, but pretty high degree of of uh of trust in that making sense and that that's uh, probably what happened uh so uh yeah i think that is that is um that's being detailed as a, a number of stories that have uh, gone into that and as you mentioned there are um israelis that were uh eyewitnesses that have you know made accounts in that way and that's also what hamas Hamas officials are basically saying the same thing. They've they've made various statements about what the uh, objectives of their mission were in terms of kidnapping and this and that. 
and um and uh so and also yeah so one of the stories said that it was a cradle story they said there was Haaretz had had detailed out 700 uh Israelis that had been killed and like sort of you know talked about them each individually and did and um half of them were police or mostly military and so so obviously Israel claims about 1400 uh, uh killed and so we still there's still more details that needed on on the rest but um if presuming it would continue in that kind of mold of something towards 50 50 in terms of in terms of um police soldiers versus civilians that's a way higher proportion of of combatant to civilian than israel does right like israel's it's always it's the it's the killing of of civilians versus combatants is you know right now we're seeing in gaza it's completely skewed towards towards uh civilians and that's not that's not like a justification for hamas killing people at, at raves and at the rave and I, and i and i that's the area one area where it seems to me there probably were people killed in the crossfire but it also seems that that um that hamas did you know execute uh, uh uh civilians in a fairly you know significant way there yeah um so uh yeah i would just yeah. add to that uh the um you know in israel every, everybody's considered a soldier it, you're it's a citizen soldier 17 to 58 so those people again not justifying it by any means but uh from hamas's point of view probably these were all military mm -hmm. personnel to some degree and and, and mm -hmm. even 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 if you look at the, the some of the stories about like the the kibbutzes that were targeted i mean they 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 had these like elaborate um security uh apparatuses and stuff like that it's like they knew they knew they knew where they were right like and that's you know like it's not that's not to like justify it but but there's been this is this is going on for 70 years right and and you have uh, Israeli officials back in the 1950s, mid 1950s, talking about the incursions from Gaza into that part of Israel uh, as basically where well, we stole their land, we drove them out. They're living in refugee camps, and they're angry with us. And they come in and they 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 attack us every so often. And you know, to a certain extent, that's just basically that dynamics now continued for 75 years. Um, and so you know, the the civilians in these kibbutzes. For the most part, they'd all been in the military. They had lots of guns around. They had a whole, you know, security uh, uh, apparatus that's both formal and informal, tied into the police and and IDF. And so, yeah, it's um, it's a uh, it's not a it's not a clear cut uh, you know situation in terms of international law. I don't know, like. You know, if you have the, somebody who was the head of the kibbutz's uh, security apparatus, who was a you know former Israeli soldier, is that considered a civilian or is that con considered a combatant? I don't know. Like you know, I don't know how you what how that would be defined if you were to get into a sort of a legal, um, uh, you know, question on that. Um, but yeah. Okay, Eve. So I think we have one last question, and that's you, Simri. Hi. Yeah, I actually wanted to touch on two points, but I'll I'll just start first, but and see if the second one is is more theor is more my own personal hypothesis about everything. But I just wanted to mention uh, with regards to what Jake said about I I too am so tired of hearing Israel has a right to defend itself. I want to gag every time I hear that. And I want to, I just today something came across my desk. I subscribed to Craig Murray. He's a UK journalist, old school guy. Mm -hmm. And he was in 2009, right after the there was a huge massacre. I'll just read you quickly the intro that he wrote. In 2009, I spoke to a demonstration of 300,000 in London against another Israeli massacre in Gaza, which coincidentally killed just over 1,400 people, the same number claimed killed during the recent Hamas attacks. Strangely, Western politicians did not shout out about Palestine's right to self-defense. A lesson for those who think history began on 7th of October, 2023. And there's a great uh, short speech, two minutes by him that you can look at at the link there. I'll just post it in. The other thing though, that I wanted to, uh, and I wish people, why doesn't it, doesn't anybody find it strange that no one ever says Palestine has a right to defend itself? Are they just supposed to lie down and die? Anyway, 
Uh, the other thing I wanted to speak to is just the whole sequence of events. Somebody uh, touched on this. First of all, Netanyahu, first of all, first of all, from my point of view, Netanyahu, I think, is a, is a psychopath. He has no conscience. He has no compunction about who he kills or what he kills. He has no loyalty to, to any living person. Okay, he financed Hamas because strategically it was good politically for him to be the good guy against these rabble rousers shooting up rockets and he knew he thought he could keep them under control. Second of all, do you remember the day October 7th happened and everybody was astonished and a little bit like, oh, wow, Israel has the best security apparatus in the world. How could they not have known there was coming? What if they did know it was coming? What if they knew this was coming and, and Netanyahu was perfectly happy to sacrifice to a few thousand of his people who cares apparently the soldiers were even told if there's hostage taking of a, an israeli citizen shoot the hostage shoot to kill shoot to kill everybody there was no like oh try to spare the hostage and no, it was just kill everybody they wanted to create as much bloodshed as possible and now today there was something else that indicates that uh yes netanyahu knew about this all along it's kind of a shock doctrine type of thing Okay. Uh, Simri, I think he wanted, Simri, uh, Simri, Simri, I, sorry, but we he has yeah, he just, has a hard I, stop at seven o'clock. Yeah, I need. So I, I, okay, okay, I need, that's it. I need to go. I wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks.